-hmm. and there goes the alcohol usage. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to suppress everything. And I tell people in therapy all the time, suppressing is just like trying to pack a suitcase and just throwing clothes in there. Now you got to sit on top of it and jump on it to try to get it zipped up. Yeah. <laughs> and the only option you have to get it zipped is to unzip it, flip it open, take everything out. Now your room is a mess. And that's like your mind. Mm -hmm. You have clothes everywhere. And you got to pick up everything one by one. Fold it. Tuck it in. Okay, I got that processed. Pick up this, piece, this pair of pants. Fold it. Okay, I got that processed. And you're in this mess of your mind trying to grab everything, shake it out, fold it nice and neat, and fit it in this suitcase. Because it's going to come out one way or the next. You can voluntarily yeah. take the clothes out or you can let it explode, break, <laughs> bust. It's going to come out. Welcome to the eat cipher. Flow hotter than the hands on Peter Piper. And now we would like to introduce you to your rivals. It's like Ali and Tyson. The hook is with the liking. So nothing, Mr. Bison. Maximus and Lee Unitas. You were in the booth with Titans. Goons, goblins, and Vikings. It ain't really nothing like us. Hey, so welcome back for another episode of the Lick Code. I'm Edgar Jones. I'm Courtney Anderson. Hey, um, if this is your first time checking us out, uh, thank you, thank you so much for being here at this moment with us. We wanna, we appreciate you being here. Uh, as always, there's a lot of options, there's a lot of uh, great content that's out here, but uh, we thank you for the support and uh, thank you for checking us out. Um, I'm extremely excited today. We got a special, special, special guest uh that's on with us uh family i've been knowing her for dang for 20 mm. oh yeah 25 <laughs> plus years um but i'm 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 not going to do the introduction i'm going to let my partner in crime uh take it over and he can go forward with doing the introduction but super excited yeah man uh shout out to y'all again for watching the lit code i think we're we're approaching 20,000 total views uh, we only put the fourth episode out yesterday, day before yesterday. Uh, and some people, man, 20,000 views might just be a drop in the bucket, but to us, it's a tidal wave, baby. We, we, <laughs> we're gonna ride that momentum on to the next thing. Like Edgar said, uh, we do have a very, very special guest with us today. Um, uh, he said 25 plus years. I'm, I'm sure, uh, I'm probably close to 30. Somewhere in there. Uh, and it's his family. It's it's my sister. We've been calling each other brother and sister for years. I think a lot of people think we really are blood related, brother and sister, but we're not. But it's just something we started up ever since uh elementary. Uh man, we we've been through elementary, junior high, high school, on the southern, on into adulthood. And uh adulthood has has its ways of, I wouldn't say cop creating riffs, but each person's individual life kind of creates space, right? As we go on into our own families and, and whatnot, but we've never lost contact. Uh, if I need her, she's, she's, she's right there and vice versa. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce y'all to Miss Aja Johnson Osbury. <clears throat> yeah. Thank y'all so much. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're excited to have, to have you. Here. Uh, so Elgin, like we talk all the time, of course, but, uh, one of our subjects that we haven't, we haven't come across yet, but we have discussed is, uh, who or what is your therapist, right? Uh, because yeah. we're, <laughs> we're under the firm belief that something's going to be your therapy, whether it's good or bad, whether it's a person, whether it's a, a, a movie, a song, a substance, uh, we'll find ways to kind of self-medicate and, and let certain things be our therapist. In our, in our communities, uh, there's a stigma around therapy or talking to somebody, right? Because you don't have to see a professional, you can just talk to somebody, but we'll talk, especially as, as black men, that uh, you just deal with whatever you're dealing with. You don't have time for that, you gotta provide, you gotta be strong. Uh, so we're taught at very young ages, not to communicate, right? And then so you'll, you'll see a lot of us lash out with anger, 
Uh, nowadays, you see a lot of us lash out on social media because we never, we make that our therapist, right? We, we never had uh, anybody to teach us how to communicate in private. So we put everything out there in public. Problem is, uh, we're just putting it out there to a bunch of other people who are not equipped to communicate it either. And then everybody gets to chime in. And what was a little confusing turns into this big ball of confusion and, and uh, it just goes haywire from there. So uh, I'll let Aja tell y'all about what she does because she is a professional in that field. Uh, and we'll kind of talk about breaking down some of those stigmas. Absolutely. So I am a licensed professional counselor supervisor in the state of Louisiana, which means I am credentialed and I am certified um, with my board of licensed professional counselors that govern me to make sure that I am ethical and that I am always working in accordance to what I am allowed to do in providing therapy services. And okay. I went to get my master's in 2012. So I've been licensed for a few years now. I work at an agency where we provide counseling services to people who have Medicaid services. And I also have a private practice where I provide services to people who either choose to private pay or have insurance. Okay. So she just gave y'all a very eloquent rundown of what she does. Uh, so here's the part that me and Elga enjoy the most, right? Uh, we get to ask each other this all the time and it, it constantly changes, right? Cause we're all evolving. Uh, and I like to say that, that we are our best and worst all at the same time, right? We're, we're a collection of experiences from, from the time we're youth until now that have been projected as who we are sitting in front of you. So we want to ask you the question, who, who are you? Who is Isa Johnson Osbury? Wow. Um, I am still, a person who is striving to always be the best version of her. I'm a helper. I've always wanted to help people. I'm someone who feels like there is something so great inside of me that can come out when I get to the healthiest version of myself. And I'm someone actively working every single day to face my demons, to face my fears, my anxieties while providing services to others. Because therapists are human as well. <laughs> And most yeah. people who are in any kind of helping field have a heart for it because they've probably experienced something along those lines. Um, mm -hmm. I'm 34 years old and I still suffer with anxiety. And a lot of people probably don't know that. I speak about it freely. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It took me a long time to figure out what it was that I was suffering with. <clears throat> and when I finally got to the bottom of it, there was shame there because it's like, but if you're the helper, you're supposed to be healthy. How can you help others? Um, mm -hmm. As I've gotten older, I've understood the beauty in that, to be able to meet people where they are, because I've had those same experiences. I battle those same demons. Fear still holds me back at times. I still don't feel good enough. On top of battling anxiety, no matter how well to put together the package looks, I've always battered, battled um, low self-esteem. So that's yeah. not something that a lot of people know about me either, because I did a really, really good job of hiding it in middle school, high school, college by coming off as this super confident, in control, strong woman. And I was everything but on the inside. Yeah. I feel like there's there's a lot of strength Thank in you, that. Thank you, for, for uh, <laughs> letting us know that, letting the viewers know it. We, we appreciate that. Thank you for that. Yeah. I feel there's a lot of strength in the last part you just said. Uh, we, we, we tend to mask a lot of stuff and hide it. But it's so much power when you uh, put it out on on Front Street, right? When you just let that all out, even if it's in private to somebody, even if it's something you wrote down, you wrote it in a letter and let somebody else read it or you said it, you hear yourself say that. And what it does is it, it uh, kind of unleashes you because you're walking around hoping nobody sees you for real. Nobody knows the secret you're trying to hold in and you're never able to be your true self because it's always... That would, what if, if, if I let too much of this out, then they'll know. But if you put it all out there, then that those chains are broken. You you release yourself every time you kind of put stuff out there. Uh, and you also said that it took you a while to, to figure out what it was, what to call it. And I think that's a big part of, of therapy, right? When you, when you talk to somebody who's well-versed in it or who's professional in it, they can kind of give you a name 
to what you have, right? That kind of leads to us having understanding. Understanding is the absence of confusion. And whenever there's confusion going around, we tend to be frustrated because it's something, but I don't know. I mean, what the hell is it? I don't really know what's going on with me, right? Yeah. So uh, I think that's one, of the, that's one of the main main reasons I want people to be okay with it. Uh, Edgar, you've, you've dealt with therapy yourself, uh, past, currently. You want to kind of give a little insight oh, right on now. Right now, yeah, yeah, <laughs> a little insight on, on some of your experiences with that and how it helped you out. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, for a while, um, I ran from the therapy side of it because I just was always, uh, for a long period of time, I always just said, you know, what's the point of me going to go talk to somebody about this? Um, and not realizing that there was a lot of underlying issues that I was dealing with. Uh, that kept rising to the surface. Um, and it wasn't just out of nowhere, like they were pretty frequently as far as coming to the surface. Uh, so it wasn't until, I would say about two and a half years ago, when I really started to say, you know what, I'm gonna go sit down, uh, talk to someone about it. Uh, my wife is a therapist as well. Uh, so she all, she's always pushed me um, to do that. Uh, but when I finally decided to go out and do it, man, it honestly was like a weight coming off my shoulder. And for me, I going back to what you brought up earlier, Courtney, um, you know, we've all done therapy in some type of form or fashion. I think with the stresses that came with me playing, being in sports um, and competing at a high level, at times I probably didn't cope with it the right way. Um, I usually probably cope with it by saying, you know, at the end of the practice, man, I'm just going to give me something to drink. Uh, if we had a bad game, uh, me going to alcohol. So that was a way just to kind of calm me down and relax me. And it's, it was such a fast paced game that you really, you ain't had time to talk about anything. So by the time I got to the house, I just wanted to sit down and chill and be quiet. But it wasn't until I got out um, two and a half years ago, I finally went and sat down and started to just get into um, and be just an open book about what I was struggling with. And the biggest thing I had to get over, and I know Isaac can relate to this, we all can, is the, the shame and the guilt and the embarrassment about, um, you know, this is how I feel. You know, I used to always look at that by saying, damn, if I say I'm feeling sad or I'm frustrated uh, or I'm hurt, uh, there's something wrong with that. But there's, there's nothing wrong with that at, at, at all. Um, I mean, those are emotions, those are natural, um, that's a natural way and that's what I was feeling. So just getting to the point of uh, not letting shame and guilt um, take over my life, that it, it, it bound me to not being able to open up my mouth and just say, hey man, this is what I'm going through or dealing with. Um, and this brings me to my, my next point. And Aj, I wanted to ask you this. Yeah. Um, why? Like, why did you start down this this uh, this journey of, of wanting to be a therapist? I will tell anyone who asked me this, it was definitely a God thing. And I actually love sharing this testimony. Up until I was a junior at Southern, I was supposed to go to law school. I had no plans on being a therapist. I never wanted to be a therapist. I always wanted to be a lawyer. So an incident happened with my family and I just felt like I was supposed to be back home. So honest to God, I came home after graduation with not a plan. I was not working in my field. Um, I, my, one of my friends at the time, her mom gave me a job. And so I was just back in Northeast Louisiana working and I did not know what my next step was, but I knew that I wanted to have higher education. I knew that a bachelor's in science was not where I was going to stop. And I was talking to one of my friends at the time who was also a mentor to me at the time. And she was like, you know, you've always been so easy to talk to. You've always been the person that your friends go to. I think you would be really, really good as a therapist. And I was like, really? And ULM had a program at the time and she was like, you have nothing to lose. Just send your paperwork in. I did and the rest is history. <laughs> so this was not a, a plan that I had for myself. And that's why I say this is a God thing because everything that she saw in me was absolutely true. Like I had always been that person in my friendship group that had deep conversation with everybody. People trusted me with their secrets. I was good at keeping secrets. I wanted to help people. So it was just God 
really getting me to where he had for me to go that I never would have gotten. Did I like the way I got to the end result? Absolutely not. I would have preferred it was something it would be something totally different. But everything that happened happened organically and it worked out for my good. And I'm in a place where I have no doubt this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, man, that's that's powerful. That's one of our favorite words too, right? Organically. Uh it's written down here in my little notebook. Eric and I first started talking about this uh, two years ago now. Uh we said stay organic, right? Yeah. In my experience, that's that's when something's built on an organic foundation. I mean, you, you can't, it's hard to beat that. Because if, if stuff falls off the top of it, we can always start back building from there, right? It's 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 already laid there. So whenever it's not quite going our way, we know we got good ground to stand on, good ground to plant in, and it's gonna whatever we whatever seeds we plant gonna grow up from there pretty good. Um, I think what you just said about being that person in your in your friendship group, I can speak to that personally, right? And I think both of us were in our respective friend groups. There's always been two sides. We've always had mutual friends. And then of course I got I got the boy gang, you got the girl gang. <clears throat> and the funny story about me is when I when I went to Southern, it was all about animal science, right? I didn't take a psychology class until maybe first semester of my senior year. And then when I did, I wish that I had been taking it from jump because we always had been that seriously. Like I was, I was uh, infatuated with the id and, and how we learn things and, and how we learn gender roles and uh, which brought me to one of my favorite mottos, always and then wise, right? I could just ask you your why. There's a reason you you chose to do this, and when you make it a when you make it a God thing or a divine thing, no matter what your your religious beliefs or your spirituality is, when you turn it into that, it never quite happens the way we think, right? But if we if we look back through hindsight, it was there all along, because you have always been an open book, you have always written your thoughts down, you, you've always been willing to express. I'm the same way, which led me to this. I didn't go into the field, but I talked to Edgar about uh, watching him motivate. And, we, and we've and we been saying it now for ever since we started putting this out, we're moving on our gifts, right? So uh, the universe, God, Buddha, Allah gives us gifts that we're born with, right? They give us a purpose. Uh, speaking, watching him speak, I can see him light up. Watching you speak from, from then till now, I can see you light up. Me expressing words, whether it be through music, poetry, speaking, I'm lighting up right now. Uh, me and Edgar like the movie Soul. I don't know if you watched it yet, but uh, <laughs> it's it's supposed to be a kid movie, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like laced with all this stuff for for yeah. adults. It's way too <laughs> deep for kids. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to watch it. I have not watched it yet, but I have heard yeah. a lot about it. Yeah, I need to sit down and watch it because they it kind of talks about it talks about your spark versus your purpose, right? And so basically, I don't want to get a move away too much, but this guy thought music was his was his purpose, right? And then through the movie, he finds out that the music was just his spark. His purpose was actually to inspire, right? Uh, so Edgar, for instance, went to the NFL. He might have thought his purpose was to play football, be an athlete, this, that, and the third. But that was his spark to get us here to now, what his purpose is, is to inspire through his story, right? I said before we got on, coming from the trailer park, coming from the alley, I came from the alley, you came from the PJ, uh, coming through all that and getting through all that trauma that we didn't know was trauma. We just thought it was normal stuff we were supposed to be surviving. Yeah. And then getting to this point, uh, and now moving on our gifts, I feel like this is what's gonna open up doors that we couldn't even imagine to be open. So I'm happy you I'm happy you stayed on that path. I'm happy you're in it. Because now looking back on it, I could see it all along. And I'm sure you could too. Yeah. Uh so I feel like uh that media, music and movies, right? Mm -hmm. It kind of fooled us into uh thinking that certain things are, are cool and certain things aren't uh and I think uh, it's one of the biggest topics we always get is the absence of the black father, right? 
Uh, and I think that leads us to a lot of the traumas and the problems that we have is usually the absence of that role model in the house with us. Uh, and I think because of music and media, right? You got your high girl summer stuff now. You got your, all of us grew up thinking we're supposed to be players. It kind of it kind of created this tension back and forth. And then after we figure out we've been fooled and we get to the point where we want this certain type of structure, well, now we got to work back through all of the, the pain that it's caused and all the confusion it's caused. How do you feel about, about that? No, I feel like you hit the nail on the head. Um, I grew up in a home where my father was not in the home with me. And so I, that anger was inside of me. <clears throat> I also grew up in a family that's full of women. And I do not remember seeing a married woman in my family, my childhood. If they were married, they were separated. And so the men that were in my family were my uncles. But mm -hmm. my aunts and my mom did not have a husband, uh, my grandmother, you know, not in the household. So growing up in a family of strong women, every Johnson that first comes to your mind <laughs> yeah. is a strong woman. And then here I am, sensitive and anxious, mm -hmm. crying, <laughs> like just could not hang with them on any level whatsoever, except, mm -hmm. you know, intellect. I had to fall back on being smart because yeah. I just, I never saw the strength that my mom, my grandmother, my aunts, my cousins had. I never saw that in myself. And I always felt like, okay, this is my family and they love me, but I just, I don't fit in. Like I'm supposed to be tougher than I am. Why am I the only one always crying? Mm -hmm. Back then, not understanding that that was anxiety. I didn't know what it was back then. Everybody just always said, oh, Aja is so emotional. She's so mm -hmm. emotional. She's so sensitive. That's what everybody labeled it. So as I'm coming up, that's what I'm thinking it is. I'm like, okay, well, I'm just sensitive. Like I just got to get a backbone. I'm just sensitive. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't that. It was anxiety the whole time. My first run-in with anxiety that I can remember was in the ninth grade. You know, just the pressure that I put on myself to be smart and be perfect for my mom because I'm an oldest child as well. And mm -hmm. I just started having these piercing headaches. I mean, they were so bad I couldn't even open my eyes. And we were, um, Courtney, I don't know if you were there, but I'm pretty sure you probably were. We were headed to a church convention one Sunday. And I was getting on the van and I was like, mama, I can't go. I can't even open my eyes. Like people talking makes my head hurt. I cannot do it. And she took me to the doctor the next Monday. And he asked me one question. And I looked at him. He, I, I remember he said, how are you? And I said, I'm fine. And he looked at me and I guess I must have had a physical reaction. And he, he asked mama, he was like, can you step out the room, please? And she said, okay. And he looked at me again and he said, now, how, how are you? And I just broke down crying. And I was like, I am stressed. I am trying to be perfect. I have all this pressure on myself. I don't feel strong enough. I don't feel pretty enough. I don't feel good enough. And he was like, okay, you have anxiety. Yeah. And he prescribed me medication. And that was my first time ever being medicated for my anxiety. It was also the first time where in my mind it started to make sense like everything started coming together because I had always been used to saying I'm fine mm -hmm. so that was what I said because I thought I was because anxiety is one of those things by the time you realize that's what you're battling it's it has taken you over it is all through you it shows up in everything that you do mm -hmm. and with me having that and low self-esteem no matter how well I performed in my business I was still never good enough I was mm -hmm. never a good enough daughter. I was never a good enough cheerleader. I was never smart enough. I was never pretty enough, skinny enough. I was never, I was never lovable enough because if mm -hmm. I was, my dad would be here. If I was a good person, if I was lovable, I would have a two parent household. Mm -hmm. And that was when it first started hitting me like, okay, I think I have anxiety. Now, mind you, I knew that in the ninth grade and somehow I forgot that. Because I get through high school, I get to college, and I'm like, I can be who I want to be in college, so I'm going to be strong. Mm -hmm. And I'm this aggressive person. Mind you, somebody I had never been before, but that's yeah. who I am in college, because I can be who I want to be down here. Like, these yeah. people don't know me. Okay, mm -hmm. I can be who I've always envisioned myself <laughs> to be in my head. Yeah. 
Yeah. I only there were people who knew me because Courtney and Melinda were there. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder, I often wonder like if both of y'all was like, I think I was just going crazy down here. Because <laughs> like I was just, I was not going to be who I was. I was not going to be weak. I just mm-hmm. wasn't. And I battled then. But when you're in college now, you can start having substances. Okay. So mm-hmm. oh, I can try smoking weed. Oh, I can get drunk and feeling weak doesn't even cross my mind. Like when I'm drunk, I am strong. I am fierce. I am beautiful. I'm pretty enough. I'm thin enough. I'm smart enough. Mm -hmm. And there goes the alcohol usage. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to suppress everything. And I tell people in therapy all the time, suppressing is just like trying to pack a suitcase and just throwing clothes in there. Now you got to sit on top of it and jump on it to try to get it zipped up. Yeah. (laughs) And the only option you have to get it zipped is to unzip it, flip it open, take everything out. Now your room is a mess. And that's like your mind. Mm -hmm. You have clothes everywhere. And you got to pick up everything one by one. Fold it. Tuck it in. Okay, I got that processed. Pick up this this pair of pants. Fold it. Okay, I got that processed. And you're in this mess of your mind, trying to grab everything, shake it out, fold it nice and neat and fit it in this suitcase. Cause it's gonna come out one way or the next. You can voluntarily take the clothes out or you can let it explode, break, (laughs) bust. It's going to come out. Yeah. Yeah. Amen, that's so true. (laughs) Yeah, man, that was, that's, that was a powerful, a powerful uh, story. And and just to answer your question, no, I didn't. I didn't think you were going crazy. I'm sure. I mean, of course, we can't remember all the talks we've had, but I'm sure we talked about it. I'm sure we we uh probably came to a head with each other because we always have been hard on each other like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, why you doing? Why you dealing with what you dealing with? I'm dealing with what I'm dealing with, right? Uh, I'm a big boy, so Courtney needs to conquer some women. That's what, <laughs> to, to hide that part, you know what I'm saying? So I'm over here trying to do what I'm trying to do. And I'm over here enjoying my substance. And I'm over here trying to build who I think I ought to be. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, and this, our last episode that we put out is about that, right? We build, we build this person, right? This super us. So he can deal with all the stuff we wanted him to deal with when we weren't strong enough. And then he or she's there now but they start to take over and then yep. they, they no longer fit in the world you're trying to get to and you got to go back and address this dude and kill him off right so you can go ahead and thrive in this world even though he built it for you he helped you she helped you get to where you need to be but now y'all clashing and it's like okay which one of us gonna gonna win because if i want to be a, a father if i want to be uh faithful if i want to be a good example for my kids where I can't, your ways can't exist here. Uh, your, you want to be a wife, you want to be uh, somebody who is, is going to naturally let your husband lead, right? That strong, strong eyes you had to build has to kind of relinquish a little of that, that independence and a little bit of that strength so it can work, right? And we got to we gotta deal with that. Uh, so how did you, how did you go back and deal with her once you, once you built that up? coming out of college, how did you go back and, and I'm sure you might be still beating her, but how, how are you beating her every day? <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely still beating her, but I think the bulk of the work was done in just really seeing myself. And that is a tough thing to do because when we build ourselves up and when you already battle with anxiety and when you already battle with low self-esteem, sometimes you take on that victim mindset. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And everything is woe is me. And it's always somebody and it's never you. And people could always be doing things better, but you're doing things perfectly. Mm-hmm. So I, I had to face who I was trying to be and who I thought I was compared to who I actually was. And who I actually was was somebody who was still drinking very, very heavily. Mm-hmm. I was somebody who still didn't feel like I could put both feet into anything. Because what if it the anxiety is back here. What if it doesn't work out? I mean, what if you're embarrassed? What if this happens? What if that happens? It's always worst case scenario. So I never put my whole self into anything. And then I started having babies. 
And I tell anybody, you know, Aspen made me a mama, a provider. Aniston made me want to be a good woman because now I got a mini me. Yeah. And now the pressure is on me. Yeah. You know, the pressure yeah. is on me to resolve and become 100% healthy or chase that every day because I'm teaching a, a little girl how to be a woman. And is mm -hmm. this what you want her to see? Are you good enough for her? And the answer was no, mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not living a congruent life. I'm mm -hmm. this way in the public and I'm battling this behind closed doors and the shame of it coming out and me losing whatever reputation I thought I had was just beyond me. Yeah. And I, I took a lot of breaks off of social media. I cried, I prayed, I, I threw myself in my work. I threw myself into my relationship with God and I just really had to face myself. Yeah. And I had to start unpacking that suitcase to pack it up nice and neat. And one of the first things that I did that gave me a huge relief was I started my relationship with my father again. And I forgave him because a lot of times when we're younger or just being in the culture that we, we're in, when people struggle with substances, we see that struggle. We don't see that trauma. Mm -hmm. And my dad was battling trauma. The substances were just suppressing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't his heart to not be there for his girls. That wasn't what was going on. His heart was to not struggle himself. And the only way he knew how to get that help was to use substances. Mm -hmm. So when I forgave my father, I didn't need any explanation about why he wasn't there. I was just like, you know, you're not, you weren't there. I had to do a lot of growing without you. It was tough. I just did not know a lot of things. And I always sought for their fatherly love and relationships. I always wanted to be in a relationship because I always wanted to be seen by somebody other than my mom. And I hurt myself a lot of times doing that, you know, and I was, I was not fair to the people that I was with when I was unhealthy because I expected them to be everything to me. <laughs> and we were children. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so I'm out here, I'm hurt, and I'm hurting other people. Hurt people hurt people, you know? I'm yeah. just leaving a trail of disaster because I'm hurt. My daddy, you know, left a trail of disaster because he was hurt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I he met my kids, and I love my daddy. I've always loved my daddy. I just didn't like my daddy, and I realized that was part of the reason why I didn't like myself. Is yeah. because I had to like all of me even the part of me that was not good and that was attached to somebody who I felt like let me down. Yeah. yeah. I also had to have hard conversations with my mama. You know, my mama is an amazing parent and she did the best that she could. She didn't understand my mental health struggles. Mm -hmm. And I just had to say growing up, this made me feel this way. So these hard conversations helps me to heal because they came from the two most important people in my life growing up that hurt Aja. These were her people. Mm -hmm. And now the adult Aja had a different set of people, but in order to get to that set and address my now family, my husband, my two kids, I had to address my two major pieces in my childhood, of course. Yeah. Golly. Yeah. Golly. <laughs> you, you okay up there, bro? That's <laughs> it. <laughs> Yo, dude, this is, hey, 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 this is so powerful. Aja, thank you again for opening up your mouth and being vulnerable and, and, and just sharing that the power that's in that. Um, yeah, I'm all right, Court. I'm just blowing away because I'm just <laughs> sitting back listening to that and scratching my head. Aja, let me let me go back a little bit and ask you mm -hmm. a question because uh, okay. you talked about it. And um, this is something that eventually at some point in time, everybody has to do. But you said you had to go back and unpack mm -hmm. and deal with yourself. Um, explain to us or, or elaborate and talk more about what that experience was like, because, you know, I think a lot of times when we hear people say that it's just, Oh, you had to go back and deal with myself, but like the pain, the, 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 the everything that comes with faith. Talk about that, Aja, please. <laughs> I feel like that was one of the most saddest, but freeing times of my life. Mm. Because to actually see who you are, not what your heart was trying to be, not what your intention was, but what your action did is tough. 
because yeah. I was one of those people like, oh, but that's not my heart. My heart was not to offend you. I never took accountability because I knew I wasn't trying to hurt somebody on purpose. But if I hit your car and I did it and I say, oh, that wasn't my heart. The car is in it and it got to be paid for. Mm-hmm. The damage yeah. is there. So, okay, that wasn't your heart, but I'm sitting here physically looking at this damage and that's what we're talking about right now. And it, it showed me a lot of behaviors that I had learned, um, just trying to protect myself growing up on how I would just shut down on people when I was upset with them. And I mean, it was nothing. You just, just stone. Look, we're not going to discuss it. It's over um, how I would communicate in an aggressive manner. Um, I was a manipulator. You know, I could make myself cry to get the result that I wanted. (laughs) I could, I'm very persuasive. Uh So I could have a great conversation and persuade you to think how I was thinking. All of these qualities that were in me for good and how I was using them for bad. Mm -mm Mm-mm-mm. So now this whole life, I got this puffed up version of myself. I'm so good. I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't do this. I don't do that. And the whole time I'm just a filthy rag, like the rest of us just trying to get it right. Mm -hmm. And I promise y'all, I walked around this house and I cried for what felt like weeks. Every time I thought about who I really had been for however long I had been this person and how far that was from where I knew I was supposed to be. Yeah. It's uh, to hear you say, you know, uh, that you walked around and cried uh, for weeks and, and an extended period of time. Um, you know, sometimes we think that that when I go and I go talk to somebody or I go and start to just do this dig and that it's just going to happen overnight. But really, for what I'm hearing is that as long as you was going with um, being this other person, and dodging and not dealing with this trauma and not dealing with all these emotions you were feeling, it took work for you to get to a place that you are in now, right? It took Absolutely. work to get there. Um, and I think that's the thing people need to understand that, that you know, it's not gonna happen overnight, but just being persistent with it um, and staying consistent and what comes out of that, the healing that actually comes. Cause to me, when you're crying, to me, you're healing uh, at that moment in time. Um, something else I got to ask you when you started to get into school and you decided, all right, this is what I want to be licensed in, and this is going to be my career. How much of what you started to learn sitting in classes, hearing professors pre uh, talk, how many aha moments that you have just kind of re you kind of sit back and sort of think about your life and be like, dang, that's what I was dealing with. Like how many times did it happen to you? So during this time when I'm getting my master's, I'm in my, early to mid-20s. So although the information resonated and I was like, oh, there there goes another dot connected. I had no aha moments Mm -hmm. because I'm living a double life still. So I'm learning this Mm -hmm. information and it makes sense. But on the flip side, I'm still drinking. I'm still um, doing everything that I need to do to suppress and not really face. It was not until years later when I was married with kids that the aha moments started coming and I was like, oh, this is what this means. And this is how you address this. Because this is the thing, when you are living um, life, not living your 100% truth and not really actively striving for your healing, the information is there and it's good information, but it has nowhere to land. Say that again. (laughs) When you are like living this life where your healing is not 100% your focal point, the uh-huh. information is there. It's always been there, but it has nowhere to land. Where it was going to land on all them daiquiris I was drinking. <laughs> that, that's all it could have landed on because there was no space in me <clears throat> for a healing for that to land on. It was nothing in my body that was like, oh, I'm ready to heal, land here. And let's start working. Absolutely not. What it was going to land on was me still trying to suppress it. Now, I knew it enough to go tell the next person, I think this is what, what needs to happen but not enough to convince myself that it was time to do it. That happened for me when desperation happened. When I realized if I don't get myself together, I will not break any generational curses and I will put my children in a situation to be me in their thirties. 
which is powerful, which is big for you to be able to recognize that. Uh, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Take it away. You <laughs> From what I'm, I mean, to speak on what you just spoke on, that's the power of timing, right? Uh, Edgar came up with a, with a concept a couple of weeks ago saying that we're always at full capacity. There's your aha moment, Elga. That's what that was. She was at full capacity and she wasn't ready to let anything else go to get that information that was being being put on her, right? Uh I she she spoke, you spoke about your, your dad, right? And uh mm -hmm. and your mother. And uh in all our lives, right? That's been a battle for all of us. Uh no matter how perfect it may have seemed to, to people on the outside. Uh, we all had to deal with our parents uh, to get past what we need to get past to grow. I had to deal with, with minds having a volatile relationship coming up. But I also had to find what good traits came out of that, right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that I am a good mediator and I'm always able to uh, listen to other people's problems and, and kind of be a strong S, we talk about disc assessments a lot, but be that steady person who can kind of take what you're giving them and then process it. Well, that was because I'm in the middle of, of two raging bulls at home, right? And I got a little sister and I need to figure out how to kind of die this down so I can get her and me out of here. So, and then I don't want to leave. I need to get her out of here. I need to come back so I can be a mediator again and keep them from, from fighting. I understand that now with timing, but coming up, I didn't. I didn't understand why I was like, man, why everybody feel comfortable calling me? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes I don't want to hit it. I don't want to have to deal with that. But yeah. now I can take that and use something that was negative and make it positive. My biggest realization was that my parents, your parents, his parents, at the time were doing the best they knew how. Uh, I tell Edgar all the time, in rural South, we that close to slavery, mm -hmm. right? Our great-grandparents were probably born on a plantation or, or at least sharecroppers. Uh, so why, during slavery, we were selectively bred, right? Then, then uh, they abolished slavery and they threw us out there and said, hey, go live, <clears throat> right? And then when we did start to form any kind of uh, uh, standardized or standard for ourselves, they started to lynch us and beat us, right? You saw the Dr. Kings, the Malcolm X's, everybody was on being powerful black people. They beat us down and then they introduced crack to us. You know what I'm saying? And then they introduced media and, and okay, it's cool to go, it's cool to, to, to be on drugs, it's cool to spend all your money on, on stuff that don't really mean nothing. Don't worry about building any kind of financial uh, stability for your family. Hey man, it's, you need to have as many women as you can. Who wants to be a husband? Right, they, they started teaching us that being a working man was square. You need to be out here hustling. It was gonna lead you to jail, right? <clears throat> so our people's taking it and it's happening now. They're, they're still doing it now with media, but our people are taking it. They didn't have any instruction. Nobody taught them how to communicate. Our, our granddaddies and great granddads were rolling stone. Nobody, you know, I know a couple with, with two and three families, you know what I'm saying? The man did what he did, the women shut up about it. And that's just the way it was. But then you have us, right? And now we have access to information while we're coming up, access they didn't have. And we, we see, we go off to college, we go places they couldn't go, and we see these other people thriving and living. Uh, my boy, Elwood Burrell, like his, his family, I tell him where we're from, that's, that's in the minority. They, they practice financial stability. For generations now, they've been doing that, right? They, they talk about marriage, they, they do all these things and they, they have family talks every Saturday at 10. Just stuff that's out of, they sit down and eat at the table. It's just stuff that blows my mind because we ain't, like that ain't really happening in our homes. When I understood that my parents were doing the best they could, mm -hmm. doing what they thought they knew to do, I started feeling better about some of the stuff that went on, right? Like you said, your, your father, you started realizing, okay, this is what he's doing. That's not what his intention was. It still hurt you, but it gave you a little bit more understanding. So now y'all can have a relationship. He can have a relationship with your kids. Elga talked about it last episode, going back and talking to his father. So little Elga can be okay. And that's what's happening most of the time with a lot of us. 
that youngster ain't okay. And we think we just gonna go ahead and live life and not address him because we made it this far, right? Why well, we gotta address that youngster? But he still creeps up, especially when it's something big about to happen. Mm -hmm. They'll creep up. Hey man, you ain't good enough for that to happen. You forgot about us. You forgot what we went through. What if everybody up here find out? You know what I'm saying? What, what you gonna do then, Mr. Big Shot? What about me? So you gotta go back and address that. And I think, I think this episode, right? Having a, a Edgar Jones, right? Who, whose name, where we're from, that's that's royalty. You go down to, you start hollering Edgar Jones, Richard Murphy's, Chris Tolliver's, Isaac Johnson's. <clears throat> uh, these are people from, y'all are people from where we're from, right? Same, those same streets, everybody's running around now. Uh, we're from those same areas, right? But to hear y'all say, hey, I'm not always okay. I hadn't always been okay, right? Uh, I struggle with this too. I, I need to talk to somebody sometimes. I had to deal with stuff sometimes. I think that's gonna be so powerful for people to hear because a lot of people look at y'all as, as what they think a finished product, right? Like I say, they look at the butterfly not realizing that it was a caterpillar that had to go in the cocoon and eat itself basically before it could eat its way back out and fly away. Uh, so just y'all opening up, man, I want to I wanna say kudos to both of y'all for being transparent. Um, I had another question somewhere. We, we went to, <laughs> we went down this, this rabbit hole, man, and I, I was in all too, Elgin. I, uh, yeah, I got a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got another question, because this is good. It almost makes me think like we need to do a part two. Mm -hmm. Eventually at some point in time, I'll bring you back on to go even deeper in this conversation. Uh, Azra, what would you say if you have somebody um, that may not want to do therapy, right? They don't wanna go sit down and go uh, for an hour or 30 minutes and go sit down and talk with a, a therapist. What would be some other things that you would recommend um, to them or individual that they could do to help them cope with how they're feeling in a healthy way, right? Because you you said it earlier that um, it's going to come out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just a matter of how it's going to come out and who it's going to come out on. Uh, but what would be some things that you would recommend or some advice timing, you would give? Timing is everything in therapy because one thing that we learn as therapists is we can't want it as bad as the client. And sometimes in session, you will see the therapist wanting it more than the person who's come in. So timing is important. Up until you get to that time and where you're ready to sit down and talk to somebody, I am so big on self-care. Okay. We live in a society where busyness, always moving, always doing something, all wake up at five and I don't go down to 11, is worshipped. Mm -hmm. If that is an everyday routine, there's no time for you to do the things that really take care of you. And that can come a lot of different ways. What are your passions? What are your hobbies? Those are two questions to ask on the front end that can kind of point you in the direction of something that feels very freeing to you, something that allows you to feel productive, but also it's just leisure time for you. Um, I'm big on what is your routine? Do you have a routine? Do you wake up and meditate? Do you pray? Do you journal? Do you write songs? Do you exercise? Do you spend any time outside? Do you ground? You know, um, do you read your Bible? These are things that we have to carve out that time in our busy schedules to just focus on things that refill us. One thing that I am going to preach and I preach in every session is we have to start becoming a people that serve others from our overflow. We also have to set boundaries. If you are at a deficit and you are on zero, you might not have the mental capacity or the emotional ability to answer that phone call for somebody asking to help them with something. A boundary would be, I cannot handle that right now and, and not feel bad about it because sometimes boundaries can feel mean. Oh, that's so mean. Or we can feel so guilty that we can't give ourselves to others. But we have to start serving people from our overflow. If my cup is not on full with something dripping over, I have nothing to give that day. I have to do something that's going to refuel me. What refuels me personally is journaling, writing poems, taking bubble baths, going outside for a walk, praying, a therapy session. 
So it's just really, I tell people all the time, it's very subjective. And I would, you know, sometimes you ask people, well, what do you do for fun? And they're like, I don't do anything for fun. And that's a therapy session in itself. Do you read books? What did you used to do for fun? Oh, I used to do this in high school. Well, why don't you do that anymore? Could you carve out time to start doing that again? What would be the first step for you to start doing that again? Self-care is at the very tip top of our regimen for ourselves or it should be. Yeah. So, oh man, this is good. So uh, boundaries, right? We talk about boundaries. It's funny we had this conversation about boundaries because I just... Uh, I can't even think who that was. I was just talking to that day about boundaries. And I think uh, for a lot of us, we want to help. We want to try to uh, do for people and provide some, some um, just to help them out and be there for them, right? So for instance, when you talked about their phone call, when you feeling like you burnt out and you ain't got nothing, and then you taking this phone call and, and it's your friend calling you and y'all been best friends for forever. And then they dumping their life and everything that's going on with them and they're putting it on you. So now you get off the phone when you feeling even more drained. And someone told me this is that if you don't learn how to set boundaries, when you learn how to set boundaries, people will really appreciate your friendship. Um, and also what I've, I've started to understand and see as well is that for me, right? Like if I don't set boundaries and I tell somebody, no, I can't do it, then I feel bad. Mm-hmm. And then out of me feeling bad, where's this bad coming from? Do you seek validation from people still? You know what I'm saying? Well, I had to sit there and be like, you know what? I think I do. Like, yep. <laughs> I think I do in some sense. So if I tell somebody no, then I feel bad about it. So now I'm beating myself up uh, about, oh man, I feel bad about telling this individual no. So I think there's so many different uh, powerful things that you said. Uh, Oswald, this is a question for you that um, I think sometimes we, 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 we use stress as this umbrella, right? Mm-hmm. Oh man, I'm stressed about this. I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. Do you think sometimes we need to start labeling more about what are we actually not necessarily stressed about, but what are you dealing with? Oh, absolutely. It's not just stress or maybe you're just angry. Maybe you're angry about an argument you got into with your significant other, or maybe you're, you have anxiety because, uh, or you're overwhelmed because you got to have a tough conversation with somebody and you don't like having tough conversations. Do you think sometimes we need to label it, we need to put more of a, a label on it about exactly what am I dealing with instead of just saying, oh, I'm stressed? Oh, not sometimes, all the time. Okay. All the time. When there is something that bubbles up inside of us, we have to take the moment to process that. And people say, well, you say process a lot. What does that mean? It means peeling back the onion because there's always another layer until you get to the root of what that emotion is because the stress is attached to something. What is that emotion? What is that feeling? And then when you get to that root, go a little bit deeper. And where does that stem from? When I hear this word, what what happens in my body? What's the first thing that pops up in my mind? Mm -hmm. Not only that, now I got to start planning. Okay, I need at least three steps that I can take to address this the next time it happens. Cause we do a great job of getting to the bottom of it, but then we have no plan moving forward. So it's like, okay, well, I know what the root is. Oh, what's the next step? The next step is three attainable goals. Okay. And I tell people in therapy all the time, you don't come to therapy to become another person. When you leave therapy, the same issues that you're battling now, you will probably see them come up again. You come to therapy for the tools to recognize and the interventions to apply for when they come up again, Now you don't need a therapist to help walk you through processing it, addressing it, having a healthy conversation about it. You have those tools yourself to use. So is it fair to say um, that that as these things start to come up, right, that uh, you say you went to that therapy session, you know, I've sat down, I'll talk with you and then I leave out and two days later, all these things started to, to pop up or this one thing starts to pop up again. It's being able to manage it in a healthy way. Is that what, is that what you're saying? Just being able to manage it. Absolutely. Um, Okay. Absolutely. Because this is the thing, a therapist does not have a magic wand to make all of your issues go away. And we will always be triggered by something. Even when we have faced it, there still might be just a small reaction in your body or just a small thought that enters your mind. It's about what's the next step. This stuff is not 
just going to erase away never to be seen again. Maybe it won't come up in that same manner, but what we deal with in life, the struggles that we we are facing each day, they will continue to present themselves. Yeah. Our job is to get better at facing them and learn something new about ourselves, leave that old way that we used to face it behind and pick up a new tool to take with us for our tool belt. Yeah. You know, it's um when I look at going back to, cause some like for me, right. When I was dealing with um, uh, my depression, when I was dealing with my battle with anger, uh, even sometimes just having tough conversations with people. Right. I, I, to me, a lot of times I like avoiding having tough conversations. Uh, typically it's been based off how I usually react in the conversation yeah. and not going good. So I tried to avoid it. Um, starting to learn that I had to go back and work on that skill set because all it, I had to work on the things that I was trying to avoid. And it took a lot of courage and it took a lot of strength and it took a lot of me doubting myself. Even after the things I've accomplished, it's still me doubting myself and like, dude, I can't do this. But learning that if I can go back and deal with this, it's really callousing me and building a skill set to help me with just other things down the road. So I almost looked at it like, no difference from me practicing jump shots, getting ready for a game, right? Like I go into the gym and shooting, I'm shooting, I'm shooting, but it's all preparation for that actual game day moment that starts to happen. And I look at life a lot more like that of the things that I'm trying to avoid. Maybe I need to move closer to it and go back and deal with it because it's just prepping me for other phases um, in my life. Absolutely. And I tell people too in therapy, and this is something that I know to be true, whatever you struggle with in one area of your life, you probably could take that and overlay it to other areas of your life. It might mm -hmm. not be the exact same thing, but there are eerie, eerie similarities, you know, yeah. like it's <clears throat> like, oh, wow. So when this happens, that happens. And this is how I react. And I can take that from work to marriage, to community, to friendship. And some of that me in, in all of those places is there. So absolutely. When you were working through your anger or just having tough conversations, the tough conversations didn't just end. They kept coming. Mm -hmm. You just got better prepared each time, more confident each time. You're working a muscle. You're working a muscle when you're applying your interventions. You're working a muscle when you're working towards your healing for you to use whenever you need to use it. And also for us to break generational curses, teach our children, model this behavior. And when you are full enough for us to reciprocate it to the people that we love. Yeah. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> yeah, man. Hey, awareness is a beautiful thing, right? So basically what I, what I just heard is, is uh, you all have, have been able to become aware with certain things up aware of certain things and now you got a plan to address it right mm -hmm. uh the crazy thing is a lot of this stuff we're talking about now uh I mean, Edgar talked about it some of the previous episodes i always mention uh your toolbox uh i like it i like to say trauma is trauma right uh no matter what it is no matter how big or small because we, we're getting to People are getting to the uh, mistake of thinking just because your trauma ain't my trauma, then mm -hmm. yours ain't as big as mine. When really it's, it's still the same thing, especially when you're approaching, uh, when you're trying to figure out how to deal with it. It's an African proverb that says, the meal of an elephant can be eaten in one day, right? It means you have to piece it off and gradually work at it. I, I always like to liken it to uh, uh, an algebraic formula, right? Now your, your characters, your numbers might change, but if you got that formula down, it's plug and play, right? No matter if, if last time the numbers may have been in the hundreds, they may have been single digit numbers and now uh, they're thousands, but I got this formula down, right? And I can take these numbers and I can plug them in and they should still get me to my answer, no matter what that trauma is. So basically uh, you said you don't have a magic wand. Your therapist, if you, if you do decide to go see a therapist, or if you talk to a friend, I don't care who it is, they're not there to fix it for you. Uh, Edgar and I like to say we, we're not experts at anything, but what Edgar did and what Courtney did to deal with our trauma, right? So we can give you a blueprint. That's all a lot of us looking for, 
right? A lot of us just confused. We don't know, especially in our, in our black communities, we confused. We don't know what you call this. We don't know what we're supposed to do with this. We're just hoping that, that you're willing to see that just because that's happening doesn't mean you're not normal. It doesn't mean that you're crazy. Uh, if, you, if it's making you cry, that don't mean you're weak. Uh, actually talking about it is one of the strongest things you can do. To, to bear your all, to tell your deepest secrets, to tell what, okay, this is what bothers me. This is my red button right here. To give that to somebody, a stranger, or somebody you might know, that's hard, that's tough. But it's necessary because sometimes we're just not equipped to deal with it ourselves. Uh, and, and Quentin, I just want to interject and add this on what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Also, the labels that people give us, because you are you don't have to be angry. You don't have to be fast. These people don't know your trauma. They don't know where that anger comes from. They don't know well, what they see in you as promiscuous, where that stemmed from. You know, mm -hmm. I think about all these people that we've seen in our lifetime, even in Ravel, that we have put labels on. Even us, even we have said, oh, mm -hmm. that girl just fast, she just, oh, she just, oh, she just this, she just that. Or, oh, all he do is do drugs. He just this, he just that, he just bad. I look back on that now and I'm so ashamed because being in this mm -hmm. field, I see those people have a story yeah. and it is not what we see with our own two eyes. It goes so much deeper. And what we were seeing was their trauma response. We were mm -hmm. seeing what they had conjured up in their bodies to protect themselves. And instead of being educated enough and open enough to see that, we labeled these people and yep. made their journey to healing even harder. Yeah. It makes me so sad to think about some of the stuff I've said, some of the stuff people around me said, my family has said about people in our community. Yeah. Because we yeah, didn't yeah. understand trauma. We didn't understand um, therapy, mental health issues. We had no understanding of any of that. No, we, we the didn't. Suffering in, the suffering in silence. Absolutely. I mean, that, you know, that, 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 um, based off your experiences, maybe you didn't have a, both parents in the house. Maybe you didn't have dad in the house. Maybe you didn't have mom in the house. Uh, feeling like nobody cares for me. So a lot of times you get to the point you feel like nobody cares and you feel like nobody wants to hear. You feel like nobody wants to hear what you got to say. Um, or you may feel like I'm, I'm stupid for what I'm saying or I'm a burden on somebody for me coming and telling them that. So now what starts to happen is that all this that's going on inside is just festering and just constantly building up. Um, and and I mean, I've dealt, that, dealt with that for quite a bit of just, man, I just deal with this by myself and not realizing that eventually what ended up happening ended up hurting me and hurting other relationships around me as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we have to be careful of that, man. We, we tend to think we're so familiar with people's struggles and what's, what's going on. Just because you know a person don't mean they hadn't told you what's going on internally. Mm -hmm. You just really don't know. You know what I'm saying? Nobody, think about, think about, eyes are growing up right and then think about her just saying she didn't feel like she was pretty enough like who <laughs> who would know that right you gotta and that's why you gotta try to take care of you gotta try to take care of each other better right because you never know nobody could have picked that up uh that she didn't feel like she was she was pretty enough i couldn't pick it up because by the time we got to southern i was getting bothered every day Hey man, what's up with your sister? <laughs> every every single day, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So just that alone, uh, people may not know that you that you felt like you were weaker when you were younger, just because, like you said last episode, you get dressed up, you look at yourself in the mirror before you leave the house. Hey man, I'm I'm looking good. And then you get there, and the first time somebody cracks a joke, all of that you built up drains out, right? And they're, they're hurting you, right? But they don't know they're hurting you until you did what? Reacted one day. Then you reacted one day. You reacted the wrong way, right? But then you found strength in that reaction. And from there, now Mr. Super Elga getting built, right? He's going to take Elga all the way to the lead, all the way out of it. But now he's still here. And now <laughs> Elga got to go be a regular citizen and a husband and all this. But Super Elga's still here. So when we having tough conversations, your voice raised a little bit. I'm not trying to talk out of this. I'm I'm about to wreck the way I know how to wreck with, with yeah. the hell got built. And uh, it's just, this is powerful to hear everybody's journey, man. And to, to get down to this point we're at now, 
is a is a powerful thing just to for y'all to bat it again. I can't say that enough how much I thank y'all for doing it. Uh um go <laughs> we, <laughs> we we are we are from from Raven, Louisiana, every every one of us, right? Uh and I wouldn't I'd rather not be from any other place. But um it's not the richest place in the world, right? Another stigma we have is, is stuff like life insurance, insurance, financial literacy. Our people, we were doing the best we could. They, they were doing the best they could. We don't preach these types of things. So my question is for people who may not be insured or they may not have the money or the means of, of paying for therapy. Is there anything out there for them? Uh, any professionals out there for them? Any programs out there to where they can get some help if they need it? Yes. So I would always say psychologytoday.com. That is a website where licensed therapists or uh, social workers or anybody providing therapeutic services are listed. And these people are verified by the website. So these are definitely people who are governed by our board, who are credentialed. Um, And you can search by last name. You can search by, um, I guess, specialties. You can search by the town or the area code that you live in. And a lot of therapists um, do not do therapy to become rich. So most therapists do have a sliding fee scale. And what that means is this is my price, but based off what you make, this is what I will accept as a cash payment from you. Mm -hmm. Therapists also um, have started accepting Medicaid. So if you are insured by the state program, um, you can find a therapist that accepts Medicaid and that will see you as a client. And it never hurts to ask. I tell people all the time, I might not be the best fit for you, but if you reach out to me and I'm pretty sure with any other licensed professional, we would try our best to help you get connected to somebody who will work with you on a pay schedule or who will provide you services. Um, Some church programs have services. One of my colleagues and friends, she does six free sessions through New St. James. Her ministry is called the Love Ministry. She is an LPCS as well, so she is qualified and certified as well, and she will do six free sessions through the church, and you do not have to be a member of New St. James to receive her services. I help her with that when there is overflow, so there are definitely programs for people who might not have the insurance or the money to um, receive mental health services. In the last past five to ten years, People have really been honing in. Celebrities have been talking more about it. And I just think as a people, we've just been more vocal about it. And with more um, talk about things, different programs have been birthed, um, different ways to get connected with people who can help have been birthed. And I'm pretty sure this is something that will continue to catch on. Yeah, great. Mr. John? I don't know, man. In the words of Mike Tyson, (laughs) man, I don't know. (laughs) It's just been... uh... This has been a very beautiful uh, conversation. A lot of uh, a lot of good stuff um, and a lot of great things being said. And check this out. If you if you're checking this out right now, you listening to this. Um, I know there was a lot of information, and sometimes you can get uh, overwhelmed with a lot of information. But if you can just take one thing from this, um, I feel like it truly will be able to help you or help someone else out just by taking simply just one thing from this. But as of now, I got more questions, but I know we always try to be respectful of time um, as well. Uh, Cause I know we can definitely dive <laughs> down the rabbit hole with some more yeah. <laughs> uh, conversations, but Oz, you definitely will be coming back for a part two. Um, Cause I want to hear more about your experiences and just the things you've learned and talking about uh generational curses um yeah so i don't have anything else court you got anything no man in in closing and wrapping it up man uh if y'all take anything away from you want to pay attention to anything pay attention to the raw emotion and the the the, uh human part of of elgin isis they told their stories right uh if you can't grab on to nothing else we ought to be able to grab on to that because a lot of people go through these same things every day, right? I brought up I brought up the absence of the black father on purpose because I know a lot of people go through that every day. Uh, and it could tear you apart if you let it, right? My hope, uh, she talks about generational curses a lot. One of the thing, one of my goals is that my point, let's say Y or Z, is point A or B for my children, 
right? Mm -hmm. So the thought process that I have now, now I just learned how to, to start having it at age 30. They start having it at age 12, 11, 10, right? That's, that's the way we're going to break these generational curses we're talking about. Because if they start to cultivate that thought at that time, then they'll be light years ahead of me by the time they're 30, 34 years old because they've been dealing with it, right? I don't just, uh, I get on my son when, he, when he's crying or whining, but I don't just lash out at him. I let him explain to me what, what he's feeling. And then I tell him, well, why it's probably not so smart to act like that or feel like that behind something that's so minuscule. But to him, it's big at the time. I've, I've learned that uh, in our quest to make it better on them, right, we tend to dismiss their traumas because their trauma might not be what ours used to be. But, I mean, it may be that pair of shoes they can't get or that game they can't get, but trauma is trauma, right? <laughs> so we have to help them deal with it same way we did. Their traumas might be different in our minds, but hey, we have these tools now, this skill set that we can pass down to them. This is how you deal with it. And if we do that in our homes and then they, they help do that out in the school or wherever they are, and it catches on 30 years from now, the little work we're doing now may be something bigger than we could ever imagine. So I want anybody that's dealing with anything to take it the same way, right? I, we, we just bared our, our ways that we dealt with stuff. We bared our traumas. Uh, so that you may have a, a blueprint, right? Or you might have your equation or the way you put your puzzle together, man. You might have saw how we put ours together. And this may be therapy for you. This podcast, I mean, at its origin, it is, it is roots. That's what it is. It's therapeutic for Egg and us to talk to each other where we were. And we said, hey, man, people might need to hear this. Somebody might need to listen to this. Uh, this may be your therapy session. But we want you to know that no matter what you're doing, you 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 having a therapy session was like we said through substance, through anger, through whatever. You letting that be your therapist, and there are other options out here for you. Uh, you have you have your eyes of Johnsons of the world. You have these professors. You have people. You have friends that are willing to listen to you. Uh, so, like I said, if you're not, if, if you don't think you're ready for that step yet to talk to a therapist, they give free disc assessments online. They can kind of point out what type, what personality type you have. The main goal is to get understanding, right? So, to minimize confusion, that's what we, we're looking to do. She just told you about some programs they have. Uh, she just told you that they, they, they'll they see you through Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you're an adult and you have children, right? Even if you, if you're not at the point where you can go talk to somebody yet, if you see some of these things that you went through as a youth, you see some of these traits <laughs> that you see in yourself starting to pop up in your kids, at least do it for them. Go ahead. They don't, we, you had a position now where you can make a decision for them. Get them to see somebody, let them talk to somebody, let them verbalize. Uh, don't, don't be stubborn and say, well, I ain't have to, I ain't have none of that. They just gonna have to deal with it. That's one of the worst things you can do. Uh, because if you do that, then you're helping that cycle keep repeating. So uh, that's all I really have. We'll let, we'll let Ms. Johnson Osbury take us on out of here with, with any final thoughts you may have. It has been a pleasure. If, if there was just one thing that I would want anyone to walk away with besides what Courtney and Edgar have already said, it's just to know that you are not alone. And any shame that you're feeling about the place that you are in right now is not real. That is just a fear inside of you that is keeping you in what you have known, is keeping you in what's familiar to you, but there's a whole other side that you can go to when and if you are ready. You are not alone. There are so many people who struggle and who are trying to put the pieces together, who are trying to connect the dots and just know there is no shame in that. There is no shame in getting your mental health together. We are only as good as our mental health. Um, if you have any questions, the best way to contact me is Aja Johnson LPC at gmail.com. That's E J A Johnson LPC at gmail.com. Any questions that you might have, I am an open book. I also have um, social media accounts on Instagram and Facebook. So search me. Any questions I can answer for you, I would love to. 
And I am so excited about a part two of this because there is so much that I still want to talk about yeah. um, in order to share things that I've learned and just information um, that we can help other people. So I am so excited. It has been a pleasure. It has been so organic. And just know that everything we discussed here today, nothing was scripted. We were all speaking from our heart and our experience. And that's the best way to be, especially when you are trying to help others feel comfortable to live and walk in their truth. Yeah, man. Mm -mm. So, yeah, we definitely gonna have a part two of this. <laughs> Y'all's are, yikes. Yeah, man. <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> this has been great. It's been another episode of the Lit Code. I'm Courtney Anderson. I'm uh, Edgar Jones. <laughs> and this Miss Isla Johnson, man. We'll we, we have her information posted up on the video. Throughout the video, we'll pop it in and out. Uh, so, man, take advantage of that. And we'll be seeing y'all soon, man. We out. Y'all stay up.